test the green dot. Good. Well, that's the advanced thing. Yeah, he tried it. Okay, that's good. Right. Okay. 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 So, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Russ Hodge uh, to come and talk to us. Russ has had an unusual uh, career trajectory. Originally hailing from Kansas, Russ graduated from the University of Kansas Lawrence in 1983 uh, uh, in French and Humanities and then got his Master's uh, in Psycholinguistics. Uh, as Russ figured, he could achieve his lifelong ambition to be a writer by understanding the way that the brain processes language. Uh, Russ graduated his MA in uh, 1986 and then gave it all up and promptly moved to Germany to study early music, playing bowed streamed instruments, uh, especially the bass and treble viol, which is a bit like an early fretted cello. Um, and then through a series of unusual interactions, Russ applied for the newly created position of uh, head of the Office of Information and Public Affairs at the EMBL in Heidelberg, uh, producing a now a now renowned EMBL uh, annual report. Uh, from there he moved to the Max Delbruck uh, in Berlin where he's been for the last 13 years. Uh, he's written over 10 books on molecular biology uh, and he's going to give his talk uh, entitled How to See a Ghost, Think Like a Molecule and Communicate Science. Thanks. Um, I, I believe that we have profoundly underestimated and probably misunderstood the way that we think about the role of communication in science, how these things fit together, and have then not been able to take advantage of some ways of using these two things to support each other. And um, I, I began to think about this when I started at Emble. My job was to write popular science, to write about the science that was going on there for the public. This was Having no scientific background, this was quite a challenge, um, and I had to very quickly develop some ways of getting information out of scientists uh, and figuring out what the heck they were talking about. Um, I noticed something really early on, and that is I had, I had the chance to meet a bunch of Nobel Prize winners and interview them for our newsletter and things. And I noticed that they were extremely good, for the most part, at explaining their science to me, to the general public and so on. And if you go to the Nobel website, you can find their banquet speeches. They always give the laureate speech. You know this because you've been practicing, so I don't have to talk about this. Um, what I wondered at that point was whether there was a connection between doing really great science and communicating very well. And that led me to another question because I was also having to teach scientists communication skills, which was impossible. I mean, I could fix their language, but there were so much the other problems that I couldn't do. Um, but then I started to wonder is if you help someone communicate better, if you could make them a better scientist. <clears throat> this was a two-way route. And I think that you can. And I would like to try to show you the mechanisms by which this works. Um, they have to do with the way we think, the way we think about science, and they have the way to do with the way that we use language to represent science. Now, what happened was, um, so it's trying to be Hello. Please mute. It's, it's ironic for me to come back to the United States and give a talk about this because America, the, the situation in which I grew up in, in America was the moon landing time and we had, there was a fabulous investment in science education, science communication. I had the best generation of teachers I think that has ever lived probably and um, really profited from this and American culture and UK culture have placed a great emphasis on teaching scientists to communicate, to write well, to give pre presentations. And they always blow away the Europeans when they come across the, the pond. Um, because they're in, in continental Europe, there's absolutely no f emphasis on this at all. Students receive no training. Their group leaders have no idea how to teach. And they haven't profited from about 100 years of research into learning theory and, and communication. Anyway, so, but, but I have to deal with problems all the time, and they're not exclusive to Germany or the Europe, so maybe it's useful to think about this. Um, having to confront those problems led me down a path which I think is very broadly useful, and that's what I'm going to try to explain to you today. So, communication is fundamental to every, every step of your career as a scientist. Um, every step has, a, has a, a building block of communication, a thesis, a paper, a, a talk, whatever. Um, in Europe, there's a lack of training, and there's a very interesting phenomenon that's very well known, and that is 
that scientists, particularly young scientists, as they're sorting out their brains and, and, and lives, uh, they have much more difficulty writing and, and talking about their own work than somebody else's work. And that's interesting. And what happens is you see they, they often confuse main points with details. They forget to kind of put the information they're trying to give you into a context. You'll find weird gaps in, or jumps in logic. And there's this real general problem of, that people have in language, and that is it's unclear somehow. It's fuzzy. Um, you, you read something, you say, I kind of know what he's trying to say, but they haven't said it in the most economic or clear way. And that's, that's very strange somehow. Um, it, it shows that language and thinking aren't the same, that there's a gap between them, that they have, one has to be translated into the other. But what is it that has to be translated? This this wet stuff, anyway. So in, I, I tried to teach this for 15 years, and I kept coming across problems in texts and talks that I just did not understand. So I decided to take a kind of genetics approach to this. Uh, the early Drosophila geneticists, um, they looked at they looked for mutations because they realized that a, a defect would tell them something about the healthy functions of a gene, its its proper functions. So I thought. Let's assume that there's a logic to errors and problems in texts and talks. Let me analyze them and see what happens and try to draw some conclusions about how this should work. Um, and that was very interesting because I found some things that I did not expect to find. And I found some patterns that, that have become extremely important and helpful uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I'm going to show you an example of a text, and this is a popular text, but exactly the same things happen in scientific texts all the time. This was written by a scientist as a press release about a project that happened at Embel. This happened after I left, so I don't take any responsibility. I always like it when you leave a place and it just goes to hell somehow. <laughs> so this is the title, Rewrite the Textbooks, Transcription is Bidirectional. And it begins like this. Genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the human genome. Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. The same is true for many other organisms that are easier to study than humans. Researchers have now unraveled how yeast generates its transcripts and have come a step closer to understanding their function. The study redefines the concept of promoters, the start size of transcription, contradicting the established notion that they support translation, transcription in one direction only. The results are also representative of transcription in humans. Now, a scientist reading this text will say, yeah, OK, fine. Um, but another person who's not a scientist, who's trying, and this was geared for the general public, let's just look at it a little bit and take it apart. So very simple question. Genes that contain instructions for making proteins make up less than 2% of the genome. Yet for unknown reasons, most of our DNA is transcribed into RNA. What is the connection between those two sentences? How do you connect the ideas in those two sentences? Because the first sentence doesn't DNA describe that the genome is actually DNA. That's one thing. So, you, so it, it might be possible if you knew that fact. Okay. So the first thing you have to know is genome and DNA. What else would you have to know? RNA is RNA is right. So you have to know this old model: DNA makes <laughs> RNA makes proteins. And you also, it also implies that you know something else, yet for unknown reasons. Well, if you knew that, you'd also have to know something about the history of that concept. And initially, that was all it was thought to do, right? <coughs> so if you find that, and you can just go on. If you, if you go on and on and on through this text, you find that there's something missing that's important to know. And I call this a ghost. Okay, a ghost is something that's invisible, but it interferes. It can it can have a disruptive influence on what's happening, and the thing is that that is very interesting. And and this this concept has profoundly changed my life because there's patterns to these things. The first step is, and the second thing is, um, I just forgot what the second thing is. No, is that ghost? Right. What was I going to say? Um, there's patterns to them. And, and secondly, they're in all types of communication. But in science, you can actually specifically say what's missing that you need to know to decode the information. So you all know any, any conversation, any type of communication is, depends on a mutual understanding of information, right? 
So you need to know what words mean and, and so on and so on. But it also depends on many other things that are much harder to kind of find. And in science, what I discovered is the way that people understand meaning and the way that science creates meaning is a, is a very interesting, special situation. And that means that you can actually say exactly what's missing to try to put these two sentences together. And what's missing is DNA makes RNA makes proteins. And if you go on, it's, it's really interesting. So um, the same is true for many other organisms. What, what is true? <laughs> um, researchers have now, what's a transcript? Uh, well, we have the word transcribe. So if, you, if, the, if the reader does a lot of work, he can say, OK, well, if you transcribe something, then you might call it a transcript. And, and this goes on and on through the text. So a, a reader could, by doing lots of Googling and Wikipedia stuff, they could figure this out. But it would take them a long time, and they give up. They don't care. So the, what, what's going on behind this text is it's gene expression, right? And so it's a, it's a little story about gene expression. Well, I decided to sort of, and, and a lot of scientists will tell you, I could never explain this story to my grandmother because she doesn't understand gene expression. And to teach her that, she would have to take three years of molecular biology. And if, so, so my grandmother would be a chemist. Sorry? So that, I, I, someone always says that. I always get punished for calling her. I, so I call it the dinner. I called it the dinner party, right? So it's not always about you, Dave. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I made a map of my map of gene expression, and I used this this thing called concept map, uh, which was invented by a, a very smart American guy. Um, who's still alive and he's, he's become a great friend. Um, it's a way of visually displaying how information is connected in your head. And it's a very simple tool you can find online. Don't do it now, you can do it later. <laughs> you just can do it if you want to know. But, so I made a map of how I think of gene expression. And it's wrong, of course, in places, and it's changed since I made it. But, but it starts with, OK, so we have transcription machinery binds to enhancers, promoters in DNA, which encodes pre-mRNA, non-coding RNA. Um, Pre-mRNA has UTRs, it has introns, and so on and so on. And so that's my map. And the question is, is to understand the story, do you need that map? Because what I want my grandmother to be able to do is to reconstruct the story, or the reader, not the grandmother, the reader, is to be able to retell this story. But to retell the story, you need not only to remember all the sentences, because you can tell it in 20 different ways, providing you understand how the information is connected. So actually, if you analyze this, you only need a little bit of it. Um, you need to know about this transcription machinery. You need to know that it binds to, you can say, promoter sequences, if that's important to you. It reads DNA. It transcribes. They used to think in one direction, but this is the only thing, this is, the only, this is what the story is about, this piece of information. You have to know that they used to think it did it in one direction. It makes RNA, and then if you want to talk about coding and non-coding stuff, that may be useful later in the story, because if you're going to explore a bit the functions of these new transcripts they found. OK, that, that map is enough, OK? And what this shows is that if you have this map in your head, you can understand that story. Probably not the way it's written. Also, if, if the person who was writing it had this in their head, they would write it in a different way. 